with Indian style serpents were considered Laotians. But on the other hand, those who ate long grain rice, built their houses on the ground and decorated them with Chinese style dragons, they were considered Vietnamese. The exact location of a person's home was not what determined his or her nationality. Instead, each person belonged to the kingdom whose cultural values he or she exhibited. And that's exactly what it is with us. We live in the world, but we live as part of God's kingdom, no we? we are to live according to his kingdom's standards and values, not the world's. You know, I was thinking as I was working on this sermon, as I was going to be talking, you didn't know how many of you would be here. You were here, and I figured you'd be here. But I thought about this. You know, everyone who's going to be listening to me knows the difference between right and wrong. You know what God's rules are, what God's standards are, you know the commandments. You know all these things. You've read it in his word. You've heard it from the sacred desk. You've heard it from your Sunday school teacher. Your parents probably taught it to you. And you pick things up. You know the difference between what's right and what's wrong. And you don't have to have somebody badger you about doing what God wants you to do. Because you know what God wants you to do, don't you? But no matter how good of a Christian you are, how perfect you think you may be, you're going to blow up once in a while. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin against God's holy law. How do I know that? Because we have 1 John 2, 1 in our Bible. John the Beloved said this, I write this to you, dear children, so that you will not sin, but if you do, we have an advocate with the Father in Christ Jesus. And then I went back 41 years. Now, if you're an adult and you go back 41 years, that's sad, isn't it? 41 years ago, February the 7th, I enlisted in the United States Air Force and went to something called basic training. Did not like basic training. I talked to some guys and they said, well, you ought to win in the Marines. Well, the Air Force is bad enough. Well, I found out real quick in the Air Force, each flight had two sergeants. We didn't call them drill sergeants in the Air Force. They were called training instructors. T-I. Called them T-I's rather than D-I's for drill instructors. And I found out that you have a good T-I and a bad T-I. The bad T-I's job is to break your independence down and make you function as a team member. Our bad T-I was named Sergeant Wilson. Tech Sergeant Wilson. Now 41 years later I still remember his name. Does that tell you something? <clears throat> Sergeant Wilson kind of reminded me of Sergeant Carter from Wilmer Powell. You remember that guy? <laughs> Sergeant Wilson was the type of guy, if you got out of step or you messed up, he would run to you and he had his Smokey the Bear hat on and he'd put his nose right against your nose. Now, he wasn't as tall as I was, but he'd put his nose to me and he'd say, What is your problem, Cummings? And he'd say something like this, Why don't you love me? Why don't you love the Air Force? Why don't you love your country? Why do you constantly break the rules, the regulations that I have so hard tried to teach you, Cole Means? Why are you so stupid? Why are you an idiot? Why are you just a little bald green man? We didn't have any hair, you remember? We wore green fatigues, so we were called little bald green men. Now, I knew I, was smart. I wasn't the smartest guy there, but I knew that I didn't want to tell the sergeant that I loved him. I didn't love him. I didn't even like him, to be honest with you. But, you know, he would get right in your face and just say, what's wrong with you? And we would begin to try to make excuses for why we messed up. Or we would begin to say, well, you know, everybody does that, Sergeant. That was just like giving him a can of gas to throw on the fire. I mean, it was really bad. So you learn just not to say a whole lot. Now, the good T.I., Tech Sergeant Barnes. Tech Sergeant Barnes was six foot five and a half. Everybody looked up to him. And one day he had us out by, our, by ourselves. He went just by himself. And he said, uh, we're marching. He said, progress. At ease. Sit down. Gather around. And he had his smoke in the bear hat on too, you know. And he said, boys, I want to tell you something. Why don't you listen to me? He said, I feel sorry for you. 
And he was a good TI, I remember. He said, you guys are new to the Air Force. You're recruits. You're rookies. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to mess up a lot. When you mess up, when you make up, and Sergeant Wilson is right in your face telling you how stupid you are and why don't you love him and all these kinds of things, here's what you should say to him. Sorry, sir. There's no excuse for that. He said, if you do it that way, he said, he's not going to be able to have anything to say to you. Well, I was one of Sergeant Wilson's targets. And I thought, well, that makes sense to me. So about two days later, I think I messed up in marching. You know, you're marching, trying to do what's right, and then you get out of step. When you get out of step, Sergeant Wilson would stop the whole flight. And he would run. And he ran right to me, put his nose against mine. He said, Comings, what is your problem? Why are you such an idiot? And on and on and on. Why did you do that? Why don't you love the Air Force? Why don't you love me? Why did you do that? And I looked at him and I said, Sergeant, sorry, sir, no excuse. And my sergeant's face turned red. He was angry because there wasn't anything he could say. He said, yeah, you're an excuse, and he walked away. But you know, I thought about that on our Christian walk. As Christians, there's going to be some times we're going to blow it. When we blow it, and God's Holy Spirit comes to us and begins to talk to us and say, Steve, you're going to blow it. Instead of trying to say, well, God, everybody does it. Have you ever had your child come to you and he's broken one of your rules? And you say, why did you do that? I told you not to do it. And they say, well, Dad, everybody does it. You know, why not? Now, I didn't do that to my dad. I knew better. Yeah. But we didn't do those kinds of things, did we? So why do we do that to God? Why do we say, well, it, it, it's okay, God, everybody does it. You just need to lighten up a little bit. Times have changed. We're more modern than you are. Why don't we just say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. You know, John said, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. Isn't it interesting to note that he didn't put a number of times we could do it? That means as many times as we do it, all we have to do is sincerely tell him we're sorry, ask him to forgive us, and the word of God says he will forgive you. But you know what the problem is for most of us? Sometimes we mess up. Many times we mess up and we ask him to forgive us and he does. And that's a neat thing when God forgives you and you just feel his love just flood over you. But then you do it again, maybe a week later. And you ask him to forgive you and he does it. And two weeks later you do it again. And you know we have an enemy called Satan who hates God. So he hates you because you're a child of God. And he comes in the picture and he says, you know, Steve, I think you've about reached your limit, don't you? Don't you? You have reached your limit. God can't forgive you anymore. You've done the same thing 30 times now. He keeps records. And you know, if we're not careful before long, we'll fall and we'll believe the lie of the devil. And it gets to the place to where we say, well, what's the use? God will forgive me, but I'll just do it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. You see, you need to understand this. God has plans for you. Listen again what Carolyn read. He has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and the future. And Peter tells us this. God is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. We serve an awesome God. A God who loves us, a God who's vitally concerned about any and everything we go through. Maybe today, you've kind of fallen prey to what I've been talking about. Maybe you have asked God to forgive you so many times that you have heard the devil say, well, your well has run dry. You're out of luck now. The good news is he'll forgive you as many times as necessary because he doesn't want anyone to perish but all to come to repentance. That's the kind of God we serve. A God who has plans for you. Would you stand with me? Father, how good your house. 
How good it is to know that you're a God who has plans for us. Plans to prosper us. Plans not to harm us. Plans for a future. And Lord, today maybe there's somebody here that has blown it. Maybe they've blown it a lot. And the old devil's really been beating them up. Tell them you've passed your limit. God's not going to forgive you anymore. And they've fallen prey to it. We reminded Jesus called Satan the father of all lies. We could paraphrase that and say he's the father of all liars. He's the originator of all lies. James reminds us to resist him and he'll flee. And one of the ways we can resist him is to talk to you. Maybe I can talk to you today. Maybe you just had a rough life. Maybe 2011 was one of those years that it was just a piss. You messed up. Maybe you just haven't asked God to forgive you for what you did. Or maybe 2011 was a year that it was just a tough year. You had all kinds of problems. Things just didn't go the way you wanted them to go. And the old devil said, well, you know what? Those kinds of things shouldn't happen to Christians, so you must not be a Christian. And he's beat you up. Sometimes I believe that we need to give our spiritual battery a jump charge, don't you? Maybe you're still a Christian. You haven't backslid, but you just have been beat up by Satan this year. And you need a special jump start on your spiritual battery. I'm going to hold you long, but I'm going to open the altar. If you'd like to talk to God about anything, maybe you've got a need that you want to share with Him. No one's going to come around you if you do. You just come down here and pray about whatever you want to pray about. And Lord, we just open the altar now. If there's anyone here, one of your kids that wants to talk to you, would you give them the courage to come? And the altar's open. Does anybody want to come and talk to Jesus? About anything. Never have a better time to talk to Jesus than today. Everything okay? Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you've done. We're thankful, Lord, that you're a God who has plans for each one of us. Sometimes your plans seem so lofty that we can't even begin to understand them. But we know, Lord, that when you have plans for us, you make them known to us. My prayer is that you would bless each of us today. Give us a good year. 2012 may it be a good year. There are many that think that this may be the year the Lord comes back in the rapture. Reminded the early Christians used to greet and say goodbye to each other by saying, Maranatha, come soon, Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. But we do know that if you come this year, we've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of people that need Jesus. Bless us and use us to share our faith with people. Go with us now our separate ways. Give us all good week for Jesus. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Amen.